in association with RM. Exciting learning. The Hadley Learning Community is a £60 million PFI development in Telford, Shropshire. An extended school with integrated primary and secondary phases, it's a cutting-edge facility designed to be the school of tomorrow, today. It's January 2006 and the secondary buildings are getting their suspended ceilings installed. Construction is on schedule for the grand opening in nine months' time. And a brand new school means an opportunity for a brand new curriculum. What would you like children to study in design technology? What would you like children to study in modern foreign languages? And when would you like them to study it? We will call that area of the curriculum English, although the teaching of it will obviously be based on the literacy strategy. That's where you'd have one of your classroom screens, yeah. yeah. The principal of the Hadley Learning Community, the HLC, is Jill Etoff. Her vision is of a curriculum that provides new opportunities for the community that the school serves. The children will come from an economically challenged area of Telford. What are the lessons going to look like? What's the experience going to be in the classroom? How are we going to make it innovative and exciting for the children? How are we going to make the best use of the resources that we've got, and ICT and all those other things? We want it to be different. I do not want it to look anything like what they've experienced before. The curriculum design is led by Hadley's two vice principals. Last January, Erica Aston, head of primary, led a team discussing primary English and cross-phase working. And Paul Topping, head of secondary, worked with subject leaders at Alton Park School, which was closing in July, with pupils moving to the HLC. Extensive consultation was vital. If you were coming to a school fresh, uh, where there were no constraints to the curriculum, what would you like children to study in design technology? What would you like children to study in modern foreign languages? And when would you like them to study it? I've always maintained that curriculum planning works best when it's a consultative process. And any head of department or assistant faculty leader worth their salt is going to want to have an input into how their subject is uh, planned within the curriculum and how it's scheduled and timetabled. But as it stands there, I've worked on five one-hour lessons, effectively two, break, one, break, two. Now, I appreciate your thoughts on this. I mean, as a practical subject, great. Not a problem. By any other concern, though, is as you go down the ability level, mm. time on task, you have to be very careful on designing the lesson to make it small changes throughout that lesson. It, it concerns me in that if you, if you put these blocks on and a student is away for a particular day, they miss it. And certainly for languages, it's got to be a little enough. And an hour is just about right. Two hours. Languages, languages. teachers have always told me that. <laughs> <laughs> they will read you. Erica Aston has the responsibility of leading the design of the primary English curriculum. We've got a change in framework, a change in thinking, a super new school to do it in. It's the best opportunity ever, isn't it, to, to get it right, really. You know, what's important to me is, is to, this morning, is to listen and understand um, where the key areas and the key focus points in key stage one and two are. A big call is what to do with literacy. Primary teaching is, is largely based around the way practitioners have worked with the literacy strategy and that speaking and listening wasn't part of that conversation at the outset. But for English, it's been a different conversation in, in, in secondary schools. And there's also, to some degree, a stigma around the word literacy in secondary schools because it creates um, perhaps a feeling for some staff that if children need literacy teaching, then they're not up to the English curriculum. We've had all that sort of debate. And we're going to call our English curriculum at, at HLC English, right across from, from foundation stage up to year 11. With the HLC being an extended school with a cross-phase curriculum, there are concerns among some primary teachers that the agenda might be dominated by their colleagues from the secondary phase. I can see where you're coming from. It does look a bit at the moment as if 
secondaries hijack this mm -hmm. and secondary background people are having these conversations which may well impact on the way that you do your job. It doesn't have that feel around it, Bob, though, does it? At, at, at leadership level? Well, it doesn't. It doesn't, doesn't from where I'm sitting. Uh, but the primary English advisor for Shropshire, Anne Gribben, is quite clear about where she thinks the priorities lie. There are lots of things about effective primary practice that secondary colleagues need to learn. Actually, uh, you know, that, and, and, and actually, if it's any way round, that's the way round it is. The conversation's been quite interesting because, for start, they're, um, they're using acronyms I've never heard of. They're talking about PIPs and DEWs. And, you know, in secondary, we've got our own, you know, our own little brand names. Um, and so even a commonality of vocabulary, I'm going to have to be on a steep learning curve. I don't know what they're talking about. Primary department that might be based around key ISP and PDMs, linking things from excellence and enjoyment, and really working through the key principles about primary pedagogy. And if we're going to make Hadley work as a real cross-phase you know, a, a school without those artificial bands in place, then we've got to enable those conversations to take place. On site, the secondary buildings are taking priority over the primary school because they have to be ready by September and the primary phase doesn't open until next January. The glazing's gone in and it's looking good. For the secondary curriculum plans, Paul Topping wants teachers to help shape the way their subjects are taught. We've invited uh, uh, subject leaders to, to kind of do a, a pitch, I suppose you could call it, really. Uh, it's a bit of marketing about their subject, uh, to look at new thinking, uh, where's the curriculum going, what's the DFES saying, how are, how are syllabus is changing. Bring that to, to, to meetings uh, with the leadership team. Tell us about what they want, and, and that's worked very well. I've been very pleased with those meetings. The stakes are high. Extra lesson time, how subjects will be blocked, even brand new courses are all up for grabs. Paul has already a pretty good picture of the new curriculum, but with a timetable to publish and only a couple of months left, this is the last chance for staff to influence his decisions. Humanities is struggling in many schools and you want to see as many pupils as possible taking it. So. Well, the only other option is to make humanities a humanities block. So, well, humanities block. So you would say that no one then could do the geography and well, history. Well, I've, I've not written off a humanities block in my own mind, but you'd have to convince me that a you had a suite of subjects that you'd be confident delivering, and we could staff, and b you could get results. I mean, if you look at if you look at that big overview of what's available. I mean, geography, business, history, um, citizenship, a humanities GCSE could possibly be delivered. I'd be really keen. To have every child having to take a uh, humanities subject. Well, I bet you would. Options like modern foreign languages have to fight for curriculum time, as usual. Yeah. Uh, low ability would get two and one hour of literacy and numeracy. I've created four option blocks right. so far, and Spanish sits with business, drama, and IT. The other alternative is to take languages out of an option block and say, well, you've got to top that up outside of curriculum time if you really want to do it. It's all provisional at the moment, you understand? Provisional, yeah. A curriculum leader worth their salt, if they want a double science or a double language or, you know, double anything to go on, it's going to identify those children and sell it to them and their parents. I mean, that, that's part of what has to happen. With staff now consulted, Paul takes some of them around the site to look at the classrooms where they'll be delivering the curriculum they've all worked so hard on. It's a big area, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good-sized lab. I think 108 square metres, that's bigger than DFES recommendations. But it will look really pucker when it's finished, I think. Although people are a bit reserved. Now, I almost think it's a shock and awe thing with them. They go into such a fantastic building and they're just completely open-mouthed with, uh, with what they see. Oh, yeah. You can get it on my screen. I can't get it on the screen, John. Sorry? I can't get it to come on the screen. With only six months to go before the HLC opens, it's time to reveal the master plan for the curriculum to an extended leadership team. So, 50 period fortnights, three hours of English, three hours of maths, two hours of core PE. There is very little difference to how current year 10 is taught. And then we're into English, English. All the blocks are five hours, apart from this one, which is four hours. You've got languages on offer, you've got 
ASDAN or whatever, or some entry level qualification for the least able, and you're mm. much more likely then, I think, to create your science and mm. maths group. You're going to have some very weak pupils mm. doing French for five years there. The presentation counters through the plans for the key stages and all goes well. But the strategy to provide extracurriculum time for teaching maths to students finding the subject difficult runs into unexpected problems. Can you go through why you've chosen to, to stick with the extra maths? In your seven? And eight and nine. How can I put this? I'm not sure that maths teaching has been a strength of the school in the past and I want it to be a feature of HLC teaching and I want the children to have access to the time that they need to be able to do that. Yeah, but it all depends on how the students are selected and the grouping. My view is that that lesson is probably delivered by a maths specialist, but it is a very different type of maths lesson to, you know, the mainstream maths. That now. worries me because it could go against what we're trying to do in mainstream maths lessons because they'll see it as a bolt-on or an add-on mm. or a punishment because they're not good mm. enough to do other but, subjects. But there's no, I mean, it's, it's not written in stone. If my department is doing its job properly, the students are set properly, all the, the right students are in the right place with the right teacher in front of them, and that and the programme should be built for them within, mm. the, within that curriculum. But if you're saying, well, actually, we don't need that much maths time, I can redistribute it. And it's a long time since I've had curriculum leaders saying, well, actually, that's far too much time. <laughs> Take it away from me. <laughs> it's but always think, the reverse. But I think it's refreshing that Emma is saying, though, actually, if we're doing our job properly and we've got a bit of extra time in Year 7, mm. which is a springboard, because I think, I think what, what, what we're focusing on here, isn't it, is that diet of the kids in the week. Decisions made, it's due. The secondary classrooms are almost ready and there's only seven weeks of the summer term left for schemes of work to be ready too. But the head of the Faculty of Pure and Applied Studies had hoped the curriculum could have been agreed sooner. I think they should have started a great deal earlier. When the building was started, the curriculum should be started because the school is more than a fantastic building, all singing, all dancing, with probes everywhere and interesting science going on. It's about the basic curriculum, and that needed really to start a long time ago. And Paul has been trying his best, but I think we're playing catch up very much at the moment. Teachers are required to put their schemes of work into a template for the leadership team to scrutinize. They need reassurance that this isn't a big brother approach. Right, looking at this course, Steph, you've got to present this uh, in the first weeks we get back. Mm -hmm. We've got a disc that we need to get uploaded onto the system. Um, which contains all the worksheets, schemes of work and everything we need from that. So the key thing is that we get what we need in front of those kids on the first day. With the HLC under the spotlight, it has to be well prepared in case those friendly people from Ofsted pop in to take a peek at the paperwork. You never quite know with um, uh, DFES and Ofsted, um, so much money being spent on, on, a, on a building. HMI could well turn up in week two or three and ask how it's going and no doubt they'll want to see that schemes are working in place. So there is an element of, of um, you know, belt and braces model to make sure that we've, we've, we're covering ourselves. With the timetable finished, a curriculum structure in place and schemes of work on the HLC server, poor topping reflects on six months hard labour. It's been hard work. I wake up at three in the morning just knowing that I've got to keep that particular plate spinning or otherwise that one will fall down. And it's very difficult. I've just had to be blunt at times with people and say, you're just going to have to be patient. I'm working, I'm burning a candle at both ends here to try and get this thing complete. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not been easy.